Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website at this time. We'd ask our guests here in-house if you'll be so kind to see that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. We, of course, will post our program on Heritage's homepage for everyone's future reference following today's presentation. And our internet viewers are always reminded that they can send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our program today is Dr. Niall Gardner. Dr. Gardner is director of our Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom, and he also served as a former aide to Lady Thatcher. He has worked at the heart of Washington's policy world for over a decade now and is an expert on the U.S.-U.K. special relationship. Dr. Gardner is a regular contributor to the London Daily Telegraph and appears frequently on both American and British television. He received his doctorate in history from Yale. Please join me in welcoming Niall Gardner. Niall. Uh, thanks very much, uh, John. Um, good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation uh, and to the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, the Right Honorable Owen Patterson, MP. Um, I first met Owen 13 years ago uh, when he was Parliamentary Private Secretary to the then leader of the Conservative Party, Ian Duncan Smith, and I was working in Lady Thatcher's private office. Uh, Owen has always been a highly principled uh, Conservative committed to advancing liberty, freedom, and national sovereignty. As Margaret Thatcher would say, Owen is truly one of us. With nearly two decades of experience in Westminster, uh, Owen Patterson has been the Conservative Member of Parliament for North Shropshire since 1997. He served as Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs from 2012 to 2014 and as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland from 2010 to 2012. After leaving uh, the Cabinet, Owen founded and now chairs the think tank UK 2020, which will set out robust common sense and optimistic, truly conservative policies for the UK. Uh, last month, Owen gave a speech in Africa denouncing the EU and the Green Blob, the coalition of environmental NGOs, collaborating officials and well-paid lobbyists who block advances in science and misinform on biotechnology. His speech on Europe last fall generated enormous press and media coverage, with commentators naming him the de facto leader of the OUT campaign, while his climate skeptic energy speech last October caused a considerable stir in the United Kingdom with regard to energy policy, which is currently entirely constrained by ideology affirmed by selective scientific data. In addition, Owen has been a powerful critic of UK defence cuts and will warn today that the Anglo-American special relationship will be weakened unless Great Britain maintains a robust commitment to defence spending. Please join me in welcoming Owen Patterson, MP. Well, good morning, everyone. And Niall, thank you very much for that uh, very kind and splendidly brief introduction. Uh, it's a real honour and pleasure to be here at the Margaret Thatcher Centre for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. Under the leadership of Senator Jim DeMint and Niall, uh, the centre is a pillar of support for the special relationship of the United States and the United Kingdom, a relationship that has shaped the modern world. It's a forum for discussion and debate about the role of the entire Anglosphere. And the alliance between our two countries and the parallel alliances with Australia, Canada, and New Zealand are unique in history. They were central to the outcomes of World War I and World War II and of the Cold War. But the fruits they sought from those successes were neither conquest nor hegemony. So this year, we celebrate 800 years since Magna Carta was sealed, absolutely central to all our countries. It established the primacy of property rights and the defense of them by the rule of law. They delivered greater political, intellectual, religious, and economic freedoms. The result was greater personal opportunity and happiness for more people in more countries than ever before in human experience. 
So this Anglosphere Alliance is central to what I will propose to you today, which is a new global role for the United Kingdom and why America should support it. Americans tend to see the EU primarily as an economic project. But it was always, and still is, primarily a political one. It uses economic means to secure political integration, with the end game, the creation of a supreme government of Europe. When Brits such as myself expose the false perceptions, as in her time, Margaret Thatcher did, many Americans raise fears that the alternative to the political union is chaos. My argument today is that British withdrawal from the European Union will reinvigorate rather than degrade those states of affairs that, from America's point of view, the original European community was established to secure. And I mean broadly shared prosperity and a Europe at peace with itself. Beyond that, I will argue that our exit will strengthen both the global trading system and the foundation of global security. And this is in tune with what Churchill told the House of Commons in June 1950, when he said, with our position at the center of the British Empire and Commonwealth, and with our fraternal association with the United States in the English-speaking world, we could not accept full membership of a federal system of Europe. And he went on to say, we must find our path to world unity through the United Nations organization, which I hope will be refounded one day upon three or four regional groups, of which a united Europe should certainly be one. By our unique position in the world, Great Britain has an opportunity, if she's worthy of it, to play an important and possibly a decisive part in all the three larger groupings of the Western democracies. Let's make sure that we are worthy of it. I'm very aware that America was deeply involved in the creation of the original European coal and steel community, the predecessor of the European common market and the European Union. Indeed, without the active encouragement and intervention of the American High Commissioner to Germany, John J. McCloy, Jean Monnet and others might not have brought the community together when they did. But the American vision was always economic, to create a Europe-wide free trade area that would ultimately have room for America, as well as Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, and a larger collection of nations where the values of freedom, democracy, and rule of law held sway. From the American point of view, opening the European continent to the free flow of goods, services, and money was part of a larger plan for global prosperity and security. The hope was that as the economies of once warring nations flourished, the people of those nations would reject communism, national socialism, and nationalist ambitions. This would ensure that the two world wars into which you had been drawn were permanent relics of a nightmare past. It was always a clear American intention to establish a bulwark against further advances of communism. This is not the time to debate the extent of the common market's role in Europe's post-war economic success, but turning to recent decades, Brussels' expanding web of prescriptive regulations, the growing weight of its social spending, and the distortions brought on by the misconceived and disastrous euro must surely be held to account for the strangling of that growth. Today, every continent on Earth is experiencing steady economic growth. The exception is Europe where the economy actually shrank in 2013 and grew by a miserable 0.3% in 2014. Even worse, over the past four decades, including periods of robust GDP growth, there's been a catastrophic lack of European job creation. The stagnation of GDO, or gross domestic opportunity, is a major reason for the outbreaks of civil unrest we've seen of late in Greece and Italy. The EU's more than a generation long tilting at the windmill of an ever closer union and its quixotic infatuation with the dulcinea of the euro has distracted the countries of the area from the essential task of delivering to their peoples strong, broadly shared individual opportunity and job growth. And that failure has spawned a permanently unemployed underclass which undermines internal security and prosperity. 
I'm personally astounded there's not been more unrest given shameful levels of youth unemployment, which in Spain reached well over 50%. From the very inception of the Schumann Plan back in 1950 and the establishment of the coal and steel community, Le Projet has been primarily political rather than economic. The euro may be the post-Maastricht EU's crowning achievement. It was the cornerstone of that political agenda, but now, with consequences that we read in our headlines almost by the day, it never made economic sense. And before anyone gets too carried away with romantic notions of the democratic achievement of bringing 28 countries into a political union, let me sketch how entirely bankrupt the institution is democratically. There is no European demos, and there has been no citizens' engagement in the creation of the project. When the British people voted in a referendum in 1975, it was to remain in a common market. Such an economic project was sold to both Parliament and the people by the Prime Ministers at the time, while all along declassified papers now revealed they knew it was a political project. And when the people of France rejected a wider and deeper union in a referendum in 2005 by 55%, and Holland rejected it by 62%, their wishes were ignored, and the rejected constitution was revamped as the Lisbon Treaty. When Ireland then held a referendum with 54% rejecting that treaty, they were told to vote again and get the answer right. The UK and Denmark were denied a vote in the face of defeat elsewhere. So strong is the desire to establish a political project that de democratic rights of the people are ignored in order to achieve it. Furthermore, I don't think it's always realised just how much the process of EU lawmaking is almost wholly removed from democratic accountability. Sure, national politicians and MEPs, members of the European Parliament, have some small opportunity to vote on things, but much of the regulation emerges from secret backroom dealing. And this is particularly the case with green laws. These are unduly influenced by big green pressure groups whose very lobbying budgets are themselves subsidized by grants from the officials they are influencing in a beautifully circular process that would count as perpetual motion if it did not require continual topping up by taxpayers. The whole process is shockingly corrupt, and its lack of accountability would make a dictator blush. So predictably, after 65 years of pursuing ever closer union, the bloc is now weighed down by unsustainable burdens. Public spending takes 49% of its combined GDP, yet the total employment rate stands at a mere 64%. As German Chancellor Angela Merkel said recently, Europe accounts for just over 7% of the world's population, produces around 25% of global GDP, and 50% of global social spending. Nothing more exemplifies Brussels' determination to pursue its political project, regardless of economics, than the manner in which the euro has been supported, in breach of treaty provisions, while the EU and its central bank bailed out Greece. Christine Lagarde, the then French finance minister, spoke the truth recently when she said, we violated all the rules because we wanted to close ranks and really rescue the eurozone. The Treaty of Lisbon was very straightforward. No bailouts. Understand that the 2007 Treaty of Lisbon provides the current constitutional basis for the European Union. To sweep it aside with impunity is a major and perhaps ultimately a fatal transgression. Whatever the countries of Europe think, they have agreed to, as long as the European Commission and Court exercise supreme power, the rules can be changed after the event. It is inconceivable that you would treat the US Constitution in such a cavalier manner. So we've now come to a fork in the road. Wasn't he Yogi Berra? Forgive me, I, but I think he was a baseball player, wasn't he? <laughs> Not a cartoon character. <laughs> wasn't it Yogi Berra who said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> the result of its accumulated contradictions and distortions is that the Eurozone must become, in effect, a new country, a United States of Europe like the United States of America. Only then 
can there be a fully redistributive federal government with legitimate means of transferring funds from wealth-creating areas such as southern Germany or Holland to places where, sadly, it is simply not possible to create wealth at the rate at which those countries join the euro, places like southern Spain, southern Italy and Greece. In order to make such a shift legally watertight, particularly with reference to German constitutional arrangements, it's most likely that the EU will eventually need a new treaty. In short, and this is critical for Americans to understand, it's not so much that Britain should leave the EU as that the EU is leaving us. It is critical to understand that the economic single market and the political EU are not one and the same thing. The single market is a formal fact under an arrangement called the European Economic Area, EEA. It's an agreement between EU member states and the three of the four members of the European Free Trade Association, EFTA, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, minus Switzerland. By switching our membership to the EEA, Britain can pursue participation in the single market without being strapped in the EU's political and judicial straitjacket. And if we join EFTA, often described as the Norway option, it would become the fourth largest trade bloc in the world. Confusing membership of the single market with membership of the EU is a common error. You can stay in the single market and not be in the EU. And the argument that leaving the EU would damage Britain's ability to continue its trade with its European neighbours and thereby damage the economy of the entire developed world, including the US, massively underestimates the huge strategic and selfish interest that our neighbours have in ensuring our continued vigorous participation in the single market. In 2013, the EU exported $342 billion worth of goods to the UK, supporting 5 million jobs on the continent, with 1 million of those jobs in Germany alone. We exported 240 billion of goods to the bloc, leaving a deficit on account of 102 billion dollars, up from 62 billion in 2011. We imported 88 billion dollars worth of goods from Germany and 37 billion from France, with a surplus for these two countries alone totaling 46 billion dollars. It is hard to imagine that our EU trading partners would wish to break off such a lucrative trading relationship. To suggest that leaving the EU would put at risk 3 million jobs attributed to UK exports to the EU is simply wrong. So here are the essential points. It's the single market comprising the 31 member European economic area that delivers jobs not the EU. Britain can leave the political project and enter into a solely economic project with Europe via the European Free Trade Association and the European Economic Area. We would still enjoy the trading benefits of the EU without the huge cost of the political and judicial baggage. The benefits to international trade and global stability that Americans have historically looked to the EU to provide would remain undisturbed. Indeed, as I'll now argue, they would be enhanced. So let's say Britain makes a switch out of the European Union into the EEA. Where would we be, America as well as Britain, by 2020? Some Americans have insisted that having Britain in the EU gives you a friend inside the councils of Europe. Few have noticed the high price you pay for having that friend on the inside rather than outside. In the world today, decision making, true decision making, takes place at a global level through a variety of bodies decided regulations. It's at the global level that having a friend counts. Yet as things stand, Britain has no seats at these top tables. We've handed power to the European Commission to represent us along with 27 other member states. On these global level councils, 
we have one twenty-eighth of a chair, hardly a leg to stand on. What I'm about to say is critical and almost entirely missed, not just in the United States, but in the United Kingdom and everywhere else. What very few understand about global processes is that in 1994, the game changed substantially. It was then that the EU adopted the WTO's Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement. This incredibly important instrument requires the participating parties, including the EU, to adopt international standards in preference to their own. Thus, if any global body adopts standards that impinge on the EU's laws, the EU is obliged to scrap its rules and implement the new standards. And this provision is not optional. The agreement uses the word shall. The EU has no choice but to replace its laws with international rules as they are adopted. And that compulsion applies to the United States as well. So as Britain's Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, I was only too well aware of how these changes affected Britain. Many of the food standards my former department must implement are no longer established in Brussels. A commission of the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome now makes them. And this multinational commission goes by the name of the Codex Alimentarius. It was established in the 1960s. It has 186 members, including the EU and Britain, although we hand our vote to the EU so that we are not functional members. As a result, we in London would often learn of new Codex rules only after they had been handed down to Brussels, and then it's too late to change them. My ministry was also subordinate to two other FAO standard-setting organisations, the World Organisation of Animal Health and the International Plant Protection Convention. The EU is obliged to embrace these standards, and then those standards are passed down to us unamended in London. If I had any illusions about what this means, I lost them on an official visit to New Zealand. And my counterpart was particularly exercised about a specific proposal of the World Organization for Animal Health, and it affected the sheep industry, which is crucial to New Zealand. And they told me how pleased they'd been to, to have got the Australians on side and believed that getting support of Canada and then the US would see a, a key amendment of theirs through. And I wondered why they hadn't asked for the UK's assistance. And they said, UK's position entirely represented by the EU. In other words, though we have one of the largest sheep flocks in the world, we had no effective voice on this key global body. In contrast, Norway's a member of the EEA. But as I said, not the EU. Norway has a huge fishing industry and appropriately plays an enormously important role in promoting regulations concerning fish in Codex by chairing the Codex Fish and Fish Products Committee. And these are regulations to which Britain, which also has a sizable fishing fleet, must submit so why not have a decent chance to influence them, as Norway does, by building alliances with like-minded countries? Regarding our discussion today, isn't it at this global level where our friendship with America most matters to Americans? The range of international standards shaping EU laws and rules is staggering. In the European car industry, for instance, the regulatory focus has moved from Brussels to Geneva. There, the EU standards start a UN regulation produced by the World Forum for the Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations. Known as WP29, it's hosted by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, and European vehicle production is extraordinarily integrated. The UK produces 1.6 million cars, but 2.6 million engines, and most of these engines are exported to Europe, and then many of them are re-imported as components of finished cars. So as we move to world standards of vehicle production, you and we would be at a massive disadvantage, or a massive advantage, if we could work together on the body influencing standards, especially as Brussels is getting overpowerful. And then there's the regulation affecting the financial services industry, such great importance to both the City of London and Wall Street, which are in many respects a single economic entity. Many of the important rules come from the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Equally important is the Financial Stability Board, founded in April 2009 by the G20 and working with the Paris-based OECD. It coordinates national financial authorities and international standard-setting bodies, and itself develops and promotes implementation of financial sector policies. In other words, key decisions on financial regulation may be made in Geneva, Paris, Bern, or Rome. They're not made in Brussels. If Britain were not in the EU, we would be working directly with these organizations 
building alliances with like-minded nations such as the United States. So here again, in today's world, it is outside the EU where America needs our friendship and where we need yours. And this is particularly necessary in view of what Columbia Law School professor Anu Bradford called the Brussels effect, where the EU is increasingly dominating the global regulatory system, even being able to dictate regulation to the United States. So as I said at the outset, the enhanced alliance of which I speak extends beyond our two countries. It includes the Anglosphere, the English-speaking countries of Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. We are all nations that could line up on the same side of most major questions of trade and finance. And beyond the Anglosphere, there is the Commonwealth of Nations. The UK, of course, has unique links to the Commonwealth, whose trade is worth around $4 trillion, where in some countries the United States is not entirely trusted. From within this great organization, we can work closely with large numbers of African nations who are beginning at last to emerge into prosperity. We have especially close links to the growing nation of South Asia. As India opens its economy and continues to rise among the world's most dynamic nations, India will become a natural ally on the world's most important matters of commerce and investment. And likewise, our strong and historical ties with Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, not only critical in themselves, but strengthen our mutual ability to work with the emerging superpower of China. The global trading system is breaking down, and to rebuild it, our nations must take the lead in a program of regulatory convergence. And the need to strengthen the Anglosphere's global hand is particularly urgent just now. EU-style regulation is restrictive and costly and to be avoided. But as Adam Smith would have understood, well-crafted promissory laws that set standards for cross-border transactions and exchange are needed to prevent a return to protectionism. Freeing the world's fifth largest economy to participate directly in international regulatory bodies would strengthen the Anglosphere's influence, creating real pressure in those bodies for expanded international trade. And let me add, as a first step to increasing the Anglosphere's robustness and for our own sakes, after Britain leaves the EU, our two countries should forge sectoral agreements in vital areas, such as pharmaceuticals and cars, where our two countries could rapidly agree. This should then lay a solid base towards embracing the Heritage Foundation's proposal for a speedy conclusion of a US-UK free trade agreement. I've said that the benefits of Britain dropping out of the EU are exactly those that led the United States to support the creation of the European institutions after the Second World War. Higher growth domestic opportunity, greater and more widely shared freedom, democracy and happiness, together the domestic foundations for international peace. But global security policy is also at stake. Leading British historian Andrew Roberts has pointed out that the high command of the modern American military was structured to mesh with the high command of the United Kingdom. That was during World War II and remains the case today. But intertwining goes further. For three quarters of a century, both countries' intelligence services have operated as nearly a single entity, as have the services of the other five eyes, that is, of the Anglosphere. Throughout our various national security establishments, capacities are complementary. This means that if one cannot hold up its responsibilities, all are compromised. And today, Britain is not holding up its part of the defense bargain. This is because the EU is not just confining its activities to trade. The Lisbon Treaty brought a concerted move to develop an EU foreign policy with the launch of the European External Action Service, intended to be the European equivalent of the State Department. Only two weeks ago, we saw Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker revive the ambitions for a European army. If this ambition was ever realized, it would cut across the close relationship between the UK and the US. It would undermine the structure of NATO and weaken the resolve of individual member states to maintain their own militaries, using the European force as an excuse for cutting back their own defense expenditure. <clears throat> so even as Vladimir Putin makes his moves, ISIS continues its barbaric slaughter in the Levant and Africa. Iran continues to fund terrorist activity around the world. We are succumbing to that temptation. We're relying on double-hatted rapid reaction forces available both to the EU and NATO as part of a multinational force, thus legitimizing reduced defense spending. 
you currently spend 4.4% of your national budget on defence, although some sources, such as the World Bank, say it's 3.8%. As recently as the mid-1980s, when the Soviet Union was a real threat, we were spending 5% of our GDP, which served us well at the time of the Falklands. We still spend over the NATO goal of 2%, but just over 2.1%. And our current budget would put us at 1.38% within a decade, making us more and more reliant on the Europeans for defence. Unsurprisingly, your military already is reported to believe that we lack the capacity to act as an independent ally. So the UK leaving the EU would regain our independence to devise our own foreign policy. Working with like-minded allies, we would forge our own defence policy and the practical requirements that should follow on from that. It is the first duty of a government to defend its citizens. And I believe we should provide the necessary funds required by an appropriate foreign policy. Whether it is aircraft carriers or improved cyber defence, I don't wish to be bound by a particular percentage. It is the required defence outcome that should be decisive. If foreign and defence requirements change, we should not be afraid to override established percentages. The essence of it, this is that continued membership of the EU requires the progressive surrender of much more than national regulatory capacities. With its long-standing political ambitions, Brussels is demanding that we let other national capacities wither. We're learning that a nation cannot give up its national responsibilities in just one area. Nationhood is indivisible because it's not just material. It's a state of mind and heart. Companies can divide themselves up and spin off divisions. A nation cannot divide its soul without losing its spirit. America needs Britain as an ally on many fronts. It needs us to reassert ourselves as a nation, to take our place once again in the councils of the world. For as Churchill said, we have our own dream and our own task. We are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked, but not comprised. We are interested and associated but not absorbed. He was right then, and he's right now. Thank you very much. Owen, thank you very much for a very powerful uh, Churchillian Thatcherite uh, speech, very wide-ranging, making uh, a tremendous case for a British exit from the European Union, a very important message, I think, for US policy makers to, uh, to hear. Uh, now I'd like to um, open the floor to, uh, to questions from the, uh, from the audience. And in fact, we already have first question right here from this gentleman. And please do um, uh, identify yourself in any institutional affiliation and, uh, and please um, keep the, answer, uh, the questions uh, as brief as possible, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Tom Reckford with the Foreign Policy Discussion Group. If the Eurozone is like Dulcinea, it would be attractive, worth protecting. Is it worth putting in jail? How do you, do you, do you rescue Dulcinea or do you throw her away? Well, Don, uh, Don Quixote was obviously very tempted and people are still portraying where this should have gone. And don't forget, this was going to lead to remarkable prosperity. It was going to bring the nations of Europe together it was going to be part of the sort of bonding experience of dissolving national boundaries, all part of this political process. And of course, it's done, tragically, it's done exactly the opposite. So you now see horrendous cartoons of uh, German officials being mocked at wearing Nazi uniforms and terrible things. It's done exactly the opposite, tragically. So um, Dulcinea is still in her village. I'm afraid the image of her has now been damaged. And the answer is obviously for us absolutely emphatically, not to join this project. And it is a given fact in British politics. It is absolutely impossible now to imagine uh, the UK ever joining the euro. So, I mean, I think our view is we wish them well. They've got themselves in a right old muddle on this. 
Um, and the only way to resolve it is to effectively form an integrated federal state, as I suggested. So you can transfer significant funds from the wealth-creating areas like southern Germany to ones where, sadly, you can't create wealth in southern, you know, southern Italy or, southern, or, where, or Greece or southern Spain. But that's where it currently is. A question right at the back there. Hello, Isabella Leo, an intern here at the Heritage Foundation. So uh, there's news coming out a few days ago that Prime Minister David Cameron announced that the UK will be joining the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, a uh, World Bank IMF-like financial institution, majorly uh, led by China, but hugely blocked here by the United States. So I'm just wondering, does it signal some kind of fractions between the UK U uh, US relations in the recent years that uh, the Prime Minister had made that announcement. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure it shows a fracture. It just shows that you know, there have always been differences of opinion on all sorts of things. Um, there's the famous uh, occasion when Ronald Reagan got blasted by Mrs. Thatcher for the invasion of Granada, and he held up the telephone to the surrounding cabin and said, isn't she marvellous? <laughs> you know, we, you know, we, we haven't, don't, don't get me wrong, we don't, uh, we've not always agreed on absolutely everything. But my contention, as I've made this morning, is that if we were... Uh, and a very important player in the European single market, the EEA, and we got our role back as a full debating and voting member on the international bodies that I mentioned, we would very likely be working in the United States in a whole range of areas of activity, including uh, banking regulation. So I see there's a chance of building alliances and working as the Anglosphere coming together as a thoroughly positive uh, unit wouldn't be cohesive, it wouldn't be institutional, but just naturally working together with our common interests and our belief, as I said, in property and defense of property by the rule of law and strong belief in free trade, which the world desperately needs. All these hideous problems we've got around the world with migration is tragedy because communities in some parts of these benighted countries cannot trade. It is incredibly important that we regalvanize the whole move to, to free trade. Now, whether this, I know this is particularly interesting with this, with this investment bank, I think it's symptomatic that we should be working more closely with the states. And, and as in our own right, I think we'd be a much more powerful body and a powerful body for good. Um, Dr. Broman. Ted Broman with the Thatcher Center here at the Heritage Foundation. If you look at the three groups in, interested in the European issue, that is the Europeans, the United Kingdom, and the United States, the UK's opinion on the European Union has moved on since the 1950s, the 1960s. The European understanding of the European Union has moved on since that period in ways that you find and I agree, find disagreeable. The US understanding really hasn't moved on, as you portrayed it. We're still stuck thinking about Europe as we did in the 1950s. It's always interesting to get the perspective of a well-informed outsider on American views would you like to characterize why we have not given more careful thought to the European issue, why our understanding remains stuck, as you put it, in the 1950s? Well, I don't think it's for me to comment on what motivates your policymakers and those who um, drive the thinking of political leaders here. It's not for me to come, come over and criticize them. What I think it is my job, which I'm trying to do today, is to inform them. So I did, uh, day before yesterday, before I left, I came over yesterday morning, met a pretty senior Tory MP who's been here frequently trying to make this argument in recent years. I said, you'll get nowhere. He said, the Americans just don't understand the European issue. You are wasting your time. Uh, but as Niles kindly gave me this platform, <laughs> I'm, I'm here very much to try to enlighten uh, like-minded uh, American conservatives that it is massively in America's self-interest to work with us on this and not to be frightened. And I do believe this sort of thinking you know, I think you're critical of your State Department. We're critical of our foreign office. It does have a bit of a mindset on this issue. And they've got to think beyond that. that the world has moved on. And they've got to respect this, this incredible, you know, sort of two or three sort of simple message what I've just said. This was always a political project. You know, Jean Monnet would be astounded if he was alive today to see how far he got this. You know, it was, it, this was all about making sure the Battle of Verdun never happened again and completely stung by the failure of the League of Nations to stop it happening again. And they believe the League of Nations failed because it could be overruled by the individual democratic states. So quite deliberately, absolutely deliberately, the very first entity, the coal and steel community, the two main ingredients of any war fighting machine, was absolutely deliberately organized so that the member states could be overruled. 
It's just, and it's astonishing how far they've got it. But that's not understood here. So the purpose of coming is to help, help explain. Hello, my name is Samuel Levy. I thank you for all your ideas. I would like you to comment on the project of the European Army, and what do you think about it? The European Army. Yeah, well, Juncker, Juncker raised this again um, what, 10 days ago. Well, this is all part of the process of building a new state. This was always intended to be a political project, to create a new entity, <coughs> and all political entities have their own means of defense. So subsuming the ability of member states to decide their own defense policy, their own foreign policy, is an integral part of that. And obviously, the physical means of delivering defense policy should be run from the center if you believe in a, that being a, a natural power of a state. So it's completely, it's completely logical what he said. And for those who believe in the project, they, they see this as a step. And don't forget, Monet tried to get this through very early, very quickly after the coal and steel community, he was balked actually by the French Parliament. And it was thrown out, and it was, he was sort of rebuffed. And that's where he went down the route of disguising this whole business as mainly an economic project. But underneath, under, under the surface, below all the talk about economics, you look at all these papers that have been published um, since, all through the, the um, accession negotiations with the then British government, it was completely clear that this was ultimately a political project. How do they view the author, the maker? How do they view the maker? Well, their, their proposals, of course, have been to take increasing responsibilities away from NATO. So they're looking for European Central Command. And, you know, th this would have all the characteristics of a European defense capability. So it would have policy making, it would have strategic coordination, it would, and it would have the physical kit under European command. And that, of course, is the, the whole idea from the, uh, the French point of view, for example. They see this as a uh, competitor to uh, the yeah. NATO alliance. Mm. Uh, and Owen, on the issue of um, defense cuts, um, which you addressed uh, in your speech, um, the Falklands has re-emerged in the news this week. Uh, the, the British Defence Secretary is now talking about sending extra troops over to the Falklands to defend against a potential Argentine attack. Uh, the Russians are leasing, I believe, 12 bombers to Argentina, mm. no doubt specifically in order to threaten the Falklands. Could you address the, the current uh, situation with regard to the Falklands issue uh, and, uh, and the need, of course, to uh, bolster British defences over there while increasing defence spending as well? Well, I haven't been to the Falklands since about, I think I went in 1997, 1998, and uh, one of the most sort of interesting places I've been to. And one little exercise I had was, there was the first visit of some Argentine journalists when I was there, since the war. And I took it upon myself to ring up, there was a fairly slim volume, the uh, Falklands Islands telephone book, and I rang up anyone with a Spanish name. And they were nearly all exiles from Allende's Chile, actually. It was quite interesting, the people who, people who had fled Chile. Everyone forgets how awful Allende was. Um, and these journalists came over you know, with, with quite a clear idea, because they'd believed all this Argentine propaganda, and were amazed to find that everybody was British. And the recent poll we had a couple of years ago, whenever it was, was, what, 98.4% in favour of the Falklands staying British. So there is absolutely no case. And, and all this talk about colonialism, it's the, it's the course, it's the, it's the Argentines who have been colonialists about this, with their imperial bazaar to, to seize the Falklands. So I think, I think what, what Mrs. Thatcher did uh, was extraordinarily brave and difficult. And of course, it was, there was significant help from the Reagan administration at the time. And I was uh, in business, uh, traveling the world uh, very extensively. And it just had an extraordinary impact. It just changed Britain's image. It, it clearly had an impact on Soviet policymakers. They thought, wow, you know, they are prepared to really put people's lives and accept that people will be killed and spend a lot of money on a principle of defending their, uh, what they see as their own territory. And all those ghastly regimes in South America, we held those idiots in military uniforms with sashes and dark glasses and their shoulders covered in scrambled eggs. You know, they all fell over. It was a, it was a massively beneficial. And you look, at, you look at those countries now prospering. So I have absolutely no doubt about it. It was an immensely 
brave, difficult uh, exercise with very good long-term benefits. And it would be just unthinkable now uh, not to defend uh, the Falklands. So I was actually delighted Michael Fallon went to the Commons yesterday under this bizarre threat from the Argentines to borrow some kit from the Russians. And uh, you know, it, would be, it would be a fundamental issue. And for the Conservative Party, absolutely fundamental that we do what is necessary to defend the Falklands. But the point of my comments just now is that at the time we were spending 5%, actually over 5%, face, face out with the Soviet Union, we did have a number of ships. We did have a capacity. And my worry now is that we've grabbed the peace dividend. Um, we inherited a complete mess on defence spending from the last Labour government. It was a 38 billion black hole. We've put that right. Uh, but there's enormous but. You know, it is still the role of the state to defend the citizen. And I think we have to accept that defence requirements will change. World circumstances have changed. Five years ago, we didn't foresee what Putin would be doing in the Crimea. We didn't foresee that ISIL could have happened. And we probably foresaw what the, uh, the uh, Iranians might have been up to funding terrorism. But we have to face the fact that if circumstances change, we change. We can't be bound in to some arbitrary percentage of GDP. And I'm not interested in this percentage of GDP. I'm interested in the outcome. We should do what is necessary. So we should establish our own foreign policy, working with allies such as you, from which follows a clear defense policy, and from which follows, ineluctably, a requirement to spend money. Now, it's not for me to decide whether we do an aircraft carrier, as I said, or cyber technology, because I know you value what we provide in the intelligence world. But it's the outcomes. And the outcomes will vary from month to month, as we saw yesterday. Extraordinary. Suddenly, the Falklands is back in the news. Oh, and switching gears a bit over to back to uh, the European Union, uh, David Cameron also pledged a referendum <coughs> in 2017, if indeed he's re-elected. Uh, and uh, could you address the, the current debate within the Conservative Party over uh, a British exit from uh, EU, known as commonly known as Brexit, um, and, and also the, the current situation perhaps in the Cabinet as well with, with regard to the debate over Britain's future in, in Europe? And is there indeed a, a divide between the grassroots of the party uh, and, uh, and David Cameron's own position? Of course, Cameron has uh, vowed to uh, try to renegotiate uh, Britain's relationship with Europe and stay in the EU. Of course, that, that is in sharp contrast <coughs> to the views of a lot of uh, party members. Well, of course, everything I've said this morning is for the birds, unless we get a Conservative majority which delivers a referendum, because we are the only party in this election in a month or so's time which is committed to delivering a referendum on this issue. So that's, that's step one. And David Cameron's been quite clear that his intention is to renegotiate a new uh, arrangement with our European neighbours. I mean, I'm clear, I, you can all go back to my Europe speech where I went to run more detail than I did this morning. I personally think the the most satisfactory and rapid uh, vehicle for delivering where I would like to get to is to trigger Article 50, which is the formal mechanism of withdrawal, because I would like to withdraw from the political arrangements and the judicial arrangements. And I didn't really touch on that this morning. You know, we are constantly under the cosh, not just from what we see as regulation, which is imposed on us, where we're not fully in the debating and creative process, as I explained about the world bodies, but as a minister in... Uh, DEFRA, the Environment Minister, you know, we were faced almost a daily basis with making decisions how far we could push interpretation of European law without getting clobbered for what's called disallowance. Disallowance is a fine. I was astounded on day one to find that my department was in the process of handing back £600 million sterling, that's about the thick end of a billion dollars, to the European Commission for the incompetent manner in which the last Labour government implemented the then Common Agricultural Policy Reform. And we're under this threat the whole time. Last week I was in South Wales. I've been heavily involved in a real threat to 2,000 jobs by the most quixotic, capricious reinterpretation of coal mine pollution regulations, which has suddenly emerged from the Commission. So we're up against this the whole time. So uh, I, I'm very clear that if, we, you know, if we, we trigger Article 50, that sets a mandatory two-year legally binding negotiating period. And that, is the, for me, is very important because it gives us two years to explain this optimistic future. Where we've got to is you know, David Cameron's made a big step, he's promised the referendum, and uh, he is confident he can deliver a satisfactory uh, agreement with the neighbours. And obviously I'm not privy to what his 
uh, negotiations have been so far, and he's been pretty canny in not revealing, quite deliberately, I think, his areas of negotiation. My view is that we, we have to go the whole hog, get back to the trade arrangement, and, the, and as I've explained this morning, but we need time to explain that that is a really positive destination. I mean, I think we have the most spectacular future outside the, the political and judicial arrangements, embracing the trade and commercial and economic aspects. But at the moment, that has not been explained. You know, there's a protest party, UKIP, which has done absolutely no work on the detail, and they are being attacked, I think quite rightly for that, uh, because their image is backward-looking and it's negative, and leaving is seen to be a frightening leap in the dark. And you talk about the Cabinet, uh, you know, the, uh, the Cabinet's met for the last time yesterday, um, our Liberal Democrat then partners spook everyone with this threat, we're going to lose three million jobs. As I've explained, A, I think there's far more than three million jobs, I suspect, involved in trade with Europe. And we are going to keep our economic relationship, and we will enhance it, and it will grow. And that's absolutely clear. But at the moment, I think you would lose an out referendum because it's not been explained the optimistic vision that I have. And out is frightening, it's unknown, and people will hang on to nurse. <laughs> We have time uh, for one last uh, question. Yep. Gentleman here. Um, my name is George Peel, I'm an attorney and freelance writer. Um, given your concerns about secret regulation and uh, Brexit and favor favoritism for Brexit, uh, should the UK take a pass on the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, or at least just start some negotiations to see what happens? <coughs> Uh, well, I was involved in negotiations with your current agriculture secretary, um, Tom Vilsack, on the agriculture angle, because all these trade deals always fall over on, on matters of food and ag, ag and fish. Um, and of course, with the, what's so sad is the, the UK and the US could agree, agree on an enormous amount. So we would be completely in tune with you on, or I certainly would be on GM, use of technology and neonicotinoids, all this sort of stuff, all the stuff the Green Blob detests. Uh, we would be agree with you. We'd probably have some disagreements on some animal welfare angles. But th there are very clear areas of agreement between the UK and the US. And what, of course, I did suggest, there are certain areas where we, could do something, we should do something very rapid, like automobiles. Automobile standards, we don't have massive disagreements. There are massive gains. Pharmaceuticals, common, common regulation in pharmaceuticals between the US and the EU could save about $60 billion a year. So I'm in favor, actually, of, of pulling off a few quick hits in sectoral areas. The problem with TTIP, it is just such a vast, all-encompassing deal. Um, it's opposed by the left in the UK. They, they, they're all spooked by the fact that uh, American companies are going to be bossing around in our famous National Health Service. And, uh, you know, I've had a whole stream of emails and letters about that. Um, but also, well, going back to my DEFRA experience, it's going to founder on the Greek definition of feta. <laughs> and you may laugh. That's deadly serious stuff and the Italian definition of Parmesan. So I remember, you know, I went to the big New York uh, food show, I think it's all the fancy food show, the big, um, America's biggest food show. And I met this enormous human beef mountain from Wisconsin. <laughs> and he had a huge white apron. It had, you know, a Wisconsin dairy across his chest. And I explained who I was, and there was a bowl of feta in front. And he said, sir, that is feta. We've always made feta. It's called feta. It tastes like feta. It is feta, and it's American feta. We're going to carry on calling it feta. I mean, there's just there is just going to be no agreement. There's, there's simply going to be no agreement. So my worry is these these vast all-encompassing deals. If you could pull them off, would be wonderful. It's supposed to it would increase world trade apparently by by a hundred billion. That's the estimate. I'm just not sure it's going to happen. And what you might be better doing would be rather less ambitious and picking things off in a narrower sphere. But I do think. There are so many areas where we would be in agreement with the states, it would be a lot easier to do a UK-US deal if we had the right to deal with you directly. Owen, thank you very much for joining us today. That was a terrific guest. Thank, um, thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you back for future events here at, uh, here at Heritage and the Margaret Thatcher Centre. Thank you. <laughs>